Welcome back to the Bruderhoff YouTube channel, and this week we're going to take a pause in our reading of <clears throat> Following the Call, um, Living the Sermon on the Mount together, because I am joined today by Charles Moore, who is the editor of this volume. Welcome, Charles. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. So Charles is visiting uh, the Woodcrest community, and I just thought uh, it would be great to take the opportunity to talk a bit more generally about why this book came into existence. What is the Sermon on the Mount? Um, why is it foremost among um, the teachings of Jesus and how we ought to think about it? So, Charles, if you wouldn't mind just starting by um, talking about why you decided to put this book together. Okay, so actually there's a, a number of reasons. Uh, on a personal level, um, one of the first books I ever read uh, was um, The Cost of Discipleship by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I was a young college student. And uh, that book really um, impacted my life. And of course, the bulk of that book um, de uh, deals with the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and uh, that really set me in, in a trajectory. Um, I was looking for others who um, would take the Sermon on the Mount as seriously as Bonhoeffer did. Um, and uh, so that eventually um, led me to um, various writings of other people, especially Eberhard Arnold, who um, is the founder of the church community, of which Rich and I are a part of. Um, and his little book, Salt and Light, uh, was uh, so uh, stimulating, so refreshing. Uh, these were talks on the Sermon on the Mount um, in his day, and he was seeking to rally people around uh, obeying Jesus's teachings. Um, and uh, so reading Eberhard Arnold and eventually joining our own community, and uh, um, which is based ultimately on the Sermon on the Mount, on Christ and his teachings. This is actually what uh, had brought our community together in 1920. This is what we seek to live out in everyday life together. Uh, so I wanted to share the insights um, that I had gleaned, not only from Bonhoeffer and Eberhard Arnold, but many others. Um, uh, 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 insights um, that would help us to grasp the significance of the Sermon on the Mount, not just in our personal lives, but as a church, uh, as Christians who are trying to follow Jesus together. So that's, that's how the collection uh, came together. It's interesting, you speak of um, rallying people to live in obedience to Jesus' commands, and that's something I, I wonder about. How did people at the, in Jesus' time hear this sermon? Because um, I think for many of us, or I should, should speak generally, it seems like for, for some Christians it seems more like a recommendation or an unattainable ideal. Um, but how would Jesus' mm -hmm. listeners have heard this sermon. Yeah, it's it, interesting. Um, I can't remember who said this, but um, one scholar said, this is the sermon that Jesus never preached. And, and what he meant by that is that J Jesus um, was an itinerant teacher. And uh, we see various portions of the Sermon on the Mount as collected by Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7. Um, elsewhere in the other Gospels, not as a sermon. Uh, and very likely what we have here are um, the, um, the core of what Jesus taught repeatedly, um, time and again in different circumstances to different, um, at different times. And Matthew, um, uh, in trying to uh, capture who Jesus was and what he taught, uh, collected these various sayings that Jesus um, would utter in various ways, in various contexts, um, together um, as a sermon. And, and this was to actually help the first Christians um, realize what the kernel of, of Jesus' teaching was all about. Um, and it's structured in a way that actually um, you can remember the flow of it uh, relatively easily. I, I've, I've taught the Sermon on the Mount to students. I have them memorize the Sermon on the Mount. It, there, there's a structure to it. Uh, why? Because it's actually meant to be at the core of um, how we follow Jesus, what it means to live out the teachings of Jesus. Uh, so going back to your question, how would they have heard um, the sermon? 
I think they would have been mesmerized um, by the various uh, sayings and commands and illustrations of Jesus. Um, probably would want to have explored those further. What, what do you mean, um, uh, turn the other cheek? Um, what, what does it mean uh, to love your enemies? And then Jesus would illustrate um, uh, that. Um, so I think they would be mesmerized, but I think they also would have been quite shocked uh, because we're talking about um, uh, a whole different way of living than what the Pharisees had, uh, were modeling and teaching. Um, and uh, I think they, they would not only have been mesmerized, but may, perhaps even shocked um, to such an extent that they wondered who this Jesus was. Um, and as they saw Jesus heal, and, and uh, they could not help but conclude, and we see this at the end of the sermon, uh, he teaches with authority. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't know exactly um, how they would have taken it, um, but they, they were captivated, I'm sure. Hmm. Um, crucially, the subtitle of this book is Living the Sermon on the Mount Together. Um, and sometimes we take the teachings of Jesus as kind of a, an instruction manual for, for personal piety mm -hmm. um, and how to be, you know, good people. Mm -hmm. um, why is that not the case? Well, I mean, the Sermon on the Mount is, is actually um, the constitution of the kingdom. And the kingdom is a corporate um, notion. Um, before we read in chapter 5, it says that Jesus went around teaching the kingdom of God. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the chapter, uh, af, um, in chapter 9, it's repeated. Jesus went and taught about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God over his people corporately. So we see plural um, pronouns used throughout. Uh, you, plural, are the salt of the earth. Um, blessed are you, um, plural. Um, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, it is not my heavenly Father, but our Father, together. Uh, this is, so to speak, um, Jesus is giving a picture he's, uh, of what it means to be a people under the rule and reign of God. And therefore, it is actually meant to be lived out together. I mean, how do you, um, for instance, um, uh, take seriously what, what Jesus says um, about, um, you've heard it said long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders is subject to judgment. And then he goes, wait a minute. You murder when you're angry at your brother, when you degrade him, um, when you call him a fool. Um, if you have something against a brother or a brother has something against you, go and reconcile. Put your gift on the altar. These are relational, social um, instructions. This isn't just... Um, uh, personal piety and, and feeling um, good about one's oneself or uh, the state of one's soul. This is meant to be put into practice corporately. Hmm. Hmm. That's fascinating. I mean, some have um, perhaps seen this sermon um, in, a, in a political light, given the situation of the, of the Jewish people at the time um, living mm -hmm. in subjugation. Um, last week, Doreen and I were discussing um, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And I was surprised to find that nowhere in the Bible. So who said that? And um, what was he, what would they have um, associated that with? Well, of course, uh, this was very controversial um, in Jesus's day. And even prior to Jesus, um, among the rabbinic um, teachers of the day, they were trying to dissect who is your neighbor. All right, who constitutes your neighbor? Um, the, the nearby one, uh, literally, uh, a fellow Jew. Uh, could a Gentile be a neighbor? Um, and, and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in, uh, being um, an occupied territory, there were plenty of enemies um, that uh, uh, the Jews uh, um, would have perceived as being in opposition to who they were um, and so forth. Um, I think um, 
Jesus often kind of quotes, not just from the Old Testament, but what's going around uh, during the day. Um, and if this is a perfect example of how far off they, they were missing the point altogether. Um, this isn't about trying to define exactly who a neighbor and who an enemy is. Essentially, God's love is indiscriminate, period. Uh, the sun shines down upon all the good and the evil. You're missing the point here. Um, this is the way of love that I'm teaching and representing. The kingdom of God is the way of love, and it's indiscriminate. Hmm. Hmm. So the way this book is organized, um, it's, it's designed to be read um, together with other people and talked about together with other people. What are other ways that you have found it helpful to read the Sermon on the Mount? Um, because we can become so familiar with the language that it fails to shock us um, over time and it mm -hmm. fails to um, confront us in our lives. Well, that's partly why I um, put together such a wide collection. I wanted different voices to weigh in to maybe help us uh, take a relook at something that has become very familiar. We can easily go to sleep saying, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn. And we may have some kind of vague idea, maybe even a specific idea of what that means. Well, let's step back and, and, um, and, and actually consider. And, and the voices in, in the book, I, I hope, help us to step back and go, ah, I didn't see that before. Um, and then by reading it together, and we know that Jesus concludes in, at the end of the sermon that we're blessed if we do what he says, right? So I think the hard work of not only trying to perhaps reflect on the various meaning, um, meanings that could be drawn from the Sermon on the Mount, but then how do we live this out um, in our context? Um, whether we are in a community or not, what does that mean to, um, to live this out in the context of work, in the context of family, in the context of my neighborhood, uh, wh whatever it might be, and, and to actually stimulate one another to do the hard work of, yes, if Jesus was living today, would he have used the illustration of being slapped um, on the cheek, turn the other? He might have used another illustration that would have been more apropos. Um, I, I remember talking with somebody who said, listen, I did not get, um, I, I didn't get a raise and I didn't get promoted and somebody else did and I do twice the work. Uh, I'm trying to think about this in terms of the insult um, and, and do I uh, work for my rights? Do, do I, uh, uh, you know, register a complaint? Um, uh, what do I do? How do I live this out? Um, in light of that particular command. So I think we need other people in our lives to hold us accountable um, and, and not just come away and going, wow, that's really amazing teaching, Jesus. It needs to be, okay, so what are we gonna do about it? And, and that applies right here in our community. It's easy to go to sleep to think that, yes, our community is based on the Sermon on the Mount, but uh, you have to live it out every day. Um, and uh, it has hands and feet, and it's usually in very small ways that we can live this out and apply it. Yeah, I mean, I've felt personally um, challenged as we've um, read through this book slowly, um, week by week. Um, and I guess, how, how, do you reckon, how do we reckon with the fact that we basically fail at this on a daily basis? How do we um, keep from despairing well, that's a good question. Um, a pastor friend of mine once said, um, you know, whenever I read the Sermon on the Mount, I just um, feel lousy. I feel beat up. I feel condemned. And I go, well, then you're not really reading the Sermon on the Mount the way Jesus meant it to be um, understood. This is actually good news, number one. It's actually good news. When Jesus says, you know, pluck your eye out, uh, cut your hand off, um, do whatever it takes, um, so that you might not lust. There's a promise in that. 
actually we can be freed from lust. And I think if we're really honest, as pleasurable as lust might be, it's miserable. It's miserable to be under the grips of lust. We can actually be freed from it and so that we can see the other as a person in the image of God and celebrate that. Um, th there's promise to be able to, to know that um, we can actually speak the truth. We don't have to hide in lies. Our words can actually be truthful. Um, and uh, it's a burden. Um, so first of all, I think we need to uh, look at these commands um, as hidden in these commands are promises. Um, but then I think one other thing is really important. Kierkegaard said, we follow a teacher. We do not follow the teachings. We obey the teachings. Uh, in other words, Jesus is the Sermon on the Mount. He lives the Sermon on the Mount. He embodies the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, come follow me like an apprentice with a master. Come, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, okay? My burden is light compared to the burdens that the world will lay on you if you don't live this way. And so um, uh, what... I think any time where we feel somehow um, all bent out of shape or even pricked in our conscience rightly from the Spirit as we read, we run to Jesus. Jesus is whom we follow. This is whom we fix our eyes on. And Jesus leads us to the cross and he says, forgive them. Forgive them. And we need to be assured that we are following the great forgiver. Um, as we seek to, to live this out. At least that's how I, I um, find new courage. <laughs> because otherwise, you take the teachings away from the teacher, uh, what do you do with them? Uh, mm -hmm. You either interpret them out of existence or you literalize them and then they are like a hammer, you know, that just is knocking on your conscience and you're just feeling all, um, you know, <clears throat> down and <clears throat> full of guilt. But the teacher, and then how did he live it out? Um, we need to follow his example, not just his teaching. Well, that's really encouraging. And um, hopefully all of you have uh, been inspired by this uh, and would love to hear your thoughts um, for Charles or questions for Charles in the, in the comments. And um, thanks so much for watching. We'll be back next week uh, picking up where we left off. Uh, I think it was chapter 24 we're heading for. So thanks again, Charles. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, doing this uh, uh, video series. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a real service. Um, I, I wish you well. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good week.